And I want to review real quick this. So I think uh, I think one of the things is this this word folly. I think that's what's really throwing a couple folks off is the word folly and and how I'm interacting with that word. I'll address that later, but um, I haven't really. I guess it's it really is relationship. Quiso, or we'll just, I don't know what to call it yet. But essentially, it just boils down to the four aspects that we had outlined. Donna, do you remember what they are? Because I think this is super important. And it's something I'm really going to start to reiterate in warrior training. I, I don't, you'd have to have, give me some kind of context, because we have the three, the four, the five, the relation, two. Relation, with relationship push hands, we, we're talking about how to make a connection, how to, uh, so first, <clears throat> and I have changed these up a little bit, and I might spell it here incorrectly, because that's not what I'm familiar with, but so. Everything's correct. Mm, we'll call them streams for now. So, and then A, practice with the moment. B, practice with ourselves. And then C, we'll be ready to practice with others. The reason I'm reiterating this is because, you know, I think even even Lisa, uh, Donna, all of us, as we go about our day, if we remember this technique, it, it it's just it changes everything. It changes the interaction. It changes the connection. It changes the mind's tendency to uh, basically act out the patterns that we would normally act out when interacting with other human beings. Because if you think about it, we've been interacting with other human beings since we were a baby. And so we've had lots of, of time to accumulate different habits with how we interact with other people, how we interact with the present moment. And just to be clear, everything is folly. Everything. <laughs> Absolute, almost anything that we can think of is a form of folly. Does that make sense? Like, I, I know it can be a little bit confusing, but uh, I know that human beings love to put themselves on a pedestal and it's like, what I'm creating will stand the test of, no, it won't. No, everything will end. Everything will become grains of sand and everything, uh, someday nobody will know who the hell Michael Jordan is and they won't, they won't uh, remember his stats and his championships or basketball so this too shall pass and that's okay because it's all folly we can just do whatever we want however we want to do it because we can does that make sense so folly isn't a um like it's not worth it or it's not good or um or it's silly that's not that's not how that word is being used it's being i think it's being misinterpreted also as my practice is intense or or pure or when I'm but when I engage with others or when I'm listening having a conversation with someone it's it's not really that important or it's not the same thing so I I just choose to do it because otherwise I would be um, alone in the woods by myself I have to interact with others so I have to I have to um, infuse folly into the whole thing, which is kind of okay, all right, but you infuse folly into everything. Everything. Yeah, everything is folly. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had to say what isn't folly, I would say the deliberate nature of my own mind. You know, everything conceptual 
that's kind of like the whole Buddha laughing belly thing. It's like, you just laugh at everything because it's all just folly. Let's not take it all too seriously. What is really, what is serious? And when you look at, you know, conversations, you know, what is a serious conversation? Why is it serious? What importance are we placing on this? Have we lost the overall context? And now we're narrowly focusing on the basement flooding. It's so important. We need to talk about it. And, you know, so it, it really is a term designed to help alleviate the human being's tendency to be overly intense and serious when it's completely unnecessary. Um, yeah, so the, the word folly is, oh, you're muted, Donna. But I see you talking. You're 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 um, distracting me from my feet on the ground and the color blue. Like I need yeah. to. That's more important. So you're a distract. This I have to engage in folly because it's a distraction from what's important of my my practice. And I, I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure I would look at it quite that way. Um, I would look at it as, you know, there's just no reason to take this all too seriously. And then because I'm not taking it too seriously, I don't want to manipulate. I don't want to control. And that's ultimately what the what what this little push hands thing is all about. So if we do this. Are you relating push hands to folly? I am. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, push hands is a, is a Tai Chi practice to partner to create martial component of Tai Chi. We're taking those elements and applying them to a psychological framework so that it's easy to remember. And it all just still does make sense. Ting is sensing energy. You can't do that with another human being when you're getting lost in the folly. You're not able to be calm, cool, collected, the mind relaxed, not entertaining thoughts while they're speaking, totally listening, not necessarily taking on because you're not thinking the same thoughts, but taking on their emotional state or matching their emotional vibration is probably a better way to say. You're not doing any of that because you're so firmly placed in the moment using these techniques. It's almost impossible to label, judge, compare, contrast, control, manipulate, and that can be important for a lot of people because this is something that is occurring on average in almost every human being because that's how we've been that's how we've been brought up to interact with our environment uh interact with the world interact with others so that's like a split attention it's like a uh, split attention right uh what do you mean you have well your attention is on still on your practice but you you're incorporating right. interacting with another human you're connecting right and joining yep that's all your stick, practice and yep. sticking exactly. and adhering yep but you're still in your practice that's right and well and all those four things are your you know that's all deliberate those right. are deliberate things deliberate acts deliberate points of attention so it's still all valid practice and that's why it's so important because number 1 i think people like to coast when they're in interactions with other people i've seen it and i've heard it and i'm that's I don't like to do it, but I know I do it. It happens. Yeah. I mean, it's actually really easy. You start to get engrossed in a conversation and before you know it, you're coasting and that coasting may not immediately lead to psychological suffering, but we're coasting. And that means that we're a leaf at the mercy of the wind. We might oh, get- Oh, when I'm coasting, it definitely right. leads to, I don't know if it leads to suffering, but it leads to um, convincing or trying to control or or- or, you know, whatever you do in conversation. Yeah. Right. And it's subtle, you know. Um, so first we practice it with the moment. And now that just involves one stream of attention. But let's say Lisa and I are going to have a conversation or any human being, period. First of all, I'm going to give my attention and combine it with hers. Those two points of attention when they come together is connection. Does that make sense? And we do that with the present moment, only it's just our attention on the present moment, and we make that firm connection. This is deliberate folly. This is how to perform it. This is the technique behind uh, what I meant by that phrase. And I still probably will change the terminology to make it more appropriate. But so first we make the connection. 
and then we we well, let's see i'll go back to the whiteboard so you can see it as i talk about join it. the join mm -hmm. i think was next yep so the the joining sounds like the connection but it can be a little bit different because i can still be aware of you be aware of your existence but if i'm thinking my own thoughts i haven't really joined you and my attention is likely going away from you right so to join them is to arrive fully with the person and and Without these techniques, it is still possible to a certain extent to maintain your practice, but with these techniques, it's guaranteed. So you don't have to do it, but if you do it, it's almost guaranteed that if you follow these four steps, the conversations that you have, the interactions that you have will be intention and will build personal power, more constructive, the energy will flow. Before you know it, you haven't really, you know how you get into a conversation and you say, you know, I really like walking. And the other person is like, well, I hate walking. I run and running is better. And you said something about you and what you like, and they just immediately launched into them. How often does that happen in conversations where the person just has the tendency to make the conversation about them? It's actually quite common. And it's not that, that elegant push hands. It's it's normal, normal conversation, and it's it's typically not very productive. It doesn't accumulate personal power, and it can definitely be an opportunity to coast and then maybe even spill tea a little bit. And then before you know it, you're talking shit about somebody, and you're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. I don't want to talk shit about this person who's not here. That's not cool. But we lost our attention. We lost our cognitive attention training, and very potentially we were coasting while doing all of that depends so, on the depends on the de it depends on the delivery sometimes uh, talking about um when it, if you're shifting the attention away from what the person is talking about to make you the center of it then i can see your point but oftentimes if you can relay and we do it in class a lot Yes. If somebody yeah. interjects their experience that is a similar one, it's to help um, elaborate the point. Sure. It, sure. Ha it helps to confirm the point that they're making. And it shows it's um, also in an effort to show, to demonstrate to the other person that you are connecting with what they're saying because you can identify it with your own experience. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's different. Uh, there's different ways to to participate in that there when you're are. yourself yeah and i would say without technique what are we doing if we're not if we're not engaging deliberate techniques then we're probably coasting and we don't really and you're right you know the conversation may be fine it may not be fine it, it we're leaf at the mercy of the wind and we've lost a little bit of our deliberate nature this is just a way to ensure it this is just an elegant way to engage another human being, engage the present moment, engage ourselves with non-judgment. So we've joined them fully. We're there. We're with them. Again, this doesn't, this isn't limited to conversations. This could be any type of interaction, interaction, period, because it's with the present moment. It's we want to fully join the moment with ourselves. If we're by ourselves, we're still doing it. We're still connected to the moment because we've given it our attention and we have fully joined. You could look at it as like arrived. I have arrived with you. I have joined you in this moment. That's how I'm I'm describing that. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And it makes sense on a feeling. You can feel it. You sure. can feel when you're doing it and you can feel when you're not doing it. It feels like a lot of, of patience and um, like when you're doing it with another person and and, it, and you can also see signs of it. And I'll, I'll get to that. Like you can see signs of conversations that are genuine exchanges that are not that are like that smooth push hands. Because if we use that physical analogy, you know, they're not trying to control one another. They're not trying to win, depending on how they're approaching the push hands. Of course, it can get into a competition, but that's not really what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's like a dance. Right. So to stick means to stay there. 
So we've joined them in the present moment and we're going to stay there as long as, as we can. Hopefully, if it's the conversation, the entire conversation, if it's just the moment in general, hopefully we stick to it. And this will be a little bit different than push hands because uh, I think push hands can get a little bit confusing. And it is really about physical energies and everything. So um, I have simplified this into just these four things. And it is a little bit different than, um, you know, Tai Chi proper. So does stick make sense? And this might sound like, again, one thing. I break it down because we can arrive with our attention. We can join them. And then before you know it, we've veered off. We didn't, we didn't stick. What could veering off be? It could be me looking at Donna, hearing mostly of what she has to say, but I'm now thinking my own thoughts. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't stick. I got unstuck. So stick means to stay with that conversation or to stay with that person or to stay with the present moment or to stay with the task or activity, whatever folly you're involved in. And folly could equal activity, <laughs> all activity under the sun. We take things way too seriously. And before you know it, we have that that complex where everything is inferior to the human being because we're just so important. And that is actually just the overemphasizing of uh, one aspect of the totality, the self, the I. The image that we hold of ourselves is super duper important. This is all designed to kind of cut that out a little bit through technique. We just do the technique, and before you know it, it's like, whoa, wait a second. I don't have to take myself too seriously. I don't have to get upset and and take what the other person is saying too seriously. And it's a practice. Trust me. Try this with every person and tell me that it's not a practice. And if you're not doing that, then very likely, you know, we may still have a point of attention in our body, but the way that the energy transference is going, you know, who who really knows how it's going to go? This, again, it, it may be fine. It may go well. It may not go well. Uh, if you're holding your points of attention, you're at least going to see how things are going, and you'll have an opportunity to redirect and make changes. This is almost a blueprint just to make sure that things are smooth and elegant from the beginning of the interaction all throughout. And if we do the practice, if we do the techniques, we're connected. We're not judging. We're not trying to manipulate them. And here is the best one. Because it here is to adapt, to move as they move, to go with them rather than against them. And that looks like questions. It looks like taking an interest and not just making the topic about yourself. Does that make sense? And it will look the same when you connect to the present moment and when you connect to yourself. You place attention. You join the present moment fully. And that's, you know, that's a similar thing, but I'm breaking it up because you can do one and then quickly lose the other. These should start to look like one thing the more that you do it, just like Tai Chi starts to look like one fluid movement. But before we learn step one, step two, step three, step four, but then eventually when you start to, to get it, it starts to look like one thing. So if somebody says, Ernest, this is all the same. I know why you would say that just like mindfulness and, and, uh, you know, being present and being mindful look like the same thing, but no, you can actually be present. You can, you can place your attention in the present moment and then start judging. And so, yeah, you, you've made the, the connection of sorts, but you started to violate the other aspects and you're thinking your own thoughts, which watch, watch how often you're thinking your own thoughts while someone else is talking. Does this make sense? And this isn't a technique that everybody has to do, but I think if people do it, they'll be really surprised at what they find. There'll be aspects of interaction that they weren't even aware of. Maybe that they're coasting. Maybe that they are thinking their own thoughts. Maybe they do start to go down that rabbit hole of taking the flashlight of attention and shining it on themselves. And not in an appropriate way, like Donna was talking about, you know, somebody gives an experience and 
I mean, I, I still think if we're doing it this way, we would probably have a follow-up question. And if two people are doing this, then they'll have a question. And now we're responding to questions. And rather, that's, a lot of conversations just seem like separate little chunks. This is you talking about yourself. This is me talking about myself in relation to the same topic. But what are we really doing here? What's really occurring in this conversation? Like, what's what are we communicating? What are we really communicating? Because that's what words are for. That's what conversation and concept and language and everything is for communication. Communication of ideas to future generations, communication to the people around me, communication to myself, etc. Does that make sense? Lisa, does this does this add up? Does this seem like it could be useful in the workplace or going about your day or when you know when people are complaining or you know, there's all sorts of examples where I think that this could be applicable. And we don't have to get caught up on the word folly. Uh, I would define everything as folly. Everything under the sun is folly. Uh, it's you could look at it as we're we're drawing our art in the sand, and the water will wash it away. There's no reason to take that too seriously. Do you see what I mean? When we do take it too seriously, very likely we will start to get into extremes. We will attempt to manipulate. We will attempt to control, and that happens when we take things too seriously too seriously implies imbalance not serious enough implies that you're just all loosey-goosey and that you just don't care about anything which may work for you but i don't think that's going to help with the interaction with the world around you very much a nice little balance it's important but i'm not gonna violate all of my principles important my school is important but it's not violate all my principles important does that make sense? Or allow myself to coast so that eventually principles could be violated. How does that sound? It sounds like it's it's another way to um, look at your practice that smooths it out and help and and helps it be continuous. Um, because um, I've noticed for myself that. Um, my interaction with other people, you know, I'll wake up in the morning and I, I, you know, do all my morning things and I have my points of attention and, and um, I do my practice and it's all a solitary thing. And then I go, when I go out into the world, even my walks on the beach, I will sometimes walk at the shoreline just to avoid the conversations or the interruptions in my of my practice and my interactions and and, and I, I recognize as you speak about this more in more detail that I do coast like I allow my interactions to be interruptions in my practice or I try to carry I, I lose points of attention when I'm engaged with other people I, maybe I still have my breath or my feet on the floor or or whatever, feeling the breeze. I have some points of attention that still exist, but I drop the rest of it, which is a form of coasting um, because I'm not holding multiple points of attention. My attention is split and, and it's split between my practice and not practicing. You know, coasting was not practicing. Um, and then I can pick it up again, but there's no reason to drop it and pick it up. If you're looking at the interaction itself as push hands and engaging your practice in that way, it can include all your other points of attention, or you can just choose um, additional ones or different ones, but you can still have multiple points of attention without losing the connection keeping connecting joining sticking adhering without losing any of that um you can incorporate your other points of attention that you have chosen but it, it's a way to maintain your practice or even deepen it it's just taking on another form it's a form of adaptation of your practice it's not um and it makes it much more smooth 
and less bumpy and can keep you in hydrostasy or wherever you're at um, in a, in a, um, in a more consistent, smooth way. Right. Exactly. And so let's say we're getting into a social interaction. We still have a little bit of our practice, but we, but we're, we're starting to go away because we're getting engrossed in the interaction, the social interaction, the barbecue or the holiday or, you know, whatever shit's going on. And that's all fine. You know, I'm not saying we should or shouldn't engage in these activities. Which of the destroyers is most likely to take take hold if we start to coast? If we start to coast and we start to go away from deliberate, we ought, we must go back to because we're still doing something. We're still operating. So if it's not deliberate, it is going towards automatic and automatic is habit and habit is heavily influenced by the destroyers. So in this example, which destroyer? Which destroyer is going to grasp us the quickest? It's easy, yeah. I think the whatever destroyer will grab you the quickest is with wherever your momentum is the greatest. So um, whether it's judging or trying to control or keep score or, you know, very so separation. It's, it, it's definitely a separation. Then it becomes a us and them thing. Oh, sure. Uh, but I would say, I mean, all of the destroyers could eventually play a part, but I think the social destroyer will be one of the first. We'll start to fall back to our social conventions. We'll start to align to the way that other people are behaving. And we'll start to catch that flow again. Does that make sense? Oh, Michael's here. And that reminds me to use the boardroom example. The boardroom example is always such a good one. So if we use the word folly in that context, it's like, well, important in the middle as opposed to too important, overly important. It's getting all of our focus. It's getting all of our cognition. Has anybody ever had a topic and it just starts to get a, a, a subject matter, a, something that you want to do, something that you want to have happen, and it just starts to get heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier that's that's a, a that's that's something occurring you know really pay attention to that if it starts to occur because your practice isn't there or you or you're going away from your practice remember this is a directional thing so you're starting to go away from your practice and then all of a sudden the crushing weight of this thing that i really want starts to be, it's not folly anymore it's starting to get really important and, the, and why? Because of self. It's all starting to focus on the infatuation and the over-importance and over-indulgence of the one aspect of the totality. And that's just how we identify the I, me. Does that make sense? Something that we address in warrior training. And that's why this is in warrior training, because it's helping to address that when you're interacting with other human beings, when you're interacting with the present moment yourself, and then when you're interacting with your own self in your own mind, you're like, no, 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 wait a second. You know, I'm not sticking and joining and adhering. There's no adaptation. It's just starting to go directionally back towards the bullshit. Does that make sense? So uh, I have put, I have framed the word folly in context of a board meeting. It's important. But if we start to go away from our practice, it will start to get heavy. It will start to get intense and it will start to become suffering. It's a burden. It's outside of the hydrostasy circle. It's it's starting. And why? Because of the tendency to get overly infatuated with yourself. I, me, this is what I want. This is why it's heavy to me. Uh, the basement flooding, it's really heavy because it's an inconvenience to me. I, what do I have to do as opposed to what I would rather be doing? See what I mean? So, but when we use these techniques, when we make, so we're going into the board meeting, step one, connect. That means give the people speaking, give the people in the room your attention. Now you can give them your attention and start judging the shit out of them. I can give Donna my attention and then all I'm doing the whole time is saying everything she says is stupid. So I have I have made a, a degree of connection with attention, 
but I, I violated the next principle because I haven't really joined her. To join a person means to clear your own mind and join them fully. My mind is not doing its own thing while you're speaking, while you're explaining something, while you're asking a question. That's called active listening authentic human interaction where we're not trying to you're not trying to control if you fully join the person because that implies mindfulness without judgment without labeling controlling and judging does that make sense so that is a loaded one i will say that the the joining is quite loaded because it implies a lot of the aspects of our practice the mind is more clear that's why this is in warrior training as well and not on day one, because we should have a little bit of practice with giving our attention and our mind being devoted to attention and our points of attention. Does that make sense? So we're continuing our Michael example, uh, not, not to pick on Michael, but it's just a great example. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's something that will be common People care about their careers. They care about their income. There's a lot of things surrounded around that. So it's important. I get it. And I'm not saying it's not important. The word folly does not mean unimportant. Though, 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 though those are not synonyms. Those are two. That's not saying the same thing. Folly means that we're just taking things lightly. We're playing with it. We're going to enjoy it. We're not going to take it so serious. It can be important. But we're not going to make it so serious that we go away from our techniques and our practice and our push hands, our yielding, redirecting if things start to get dicey. And I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to redirect the conversation. Does that make sense? So, uh, but so we had join, and now we need to stick to the, and that means stay there. So Michael goes into the boardroom. He connects to the speaker and the people around him by giving them his attention. He joins fully, and his attention is not divided. He's there. Some people, this may come a little more naturally, but I'm putting this in there specifically to address the social destroyer and warrior training. Uh, social and you'd be surprised that a lot of conversations start to, to take on the essence of the other destroyers. Uh, interaction with you know you know men and women and women and or whatever you're attracted to before you know it biology starting to sneak in because the attempts to manipulate can be quite subtle the tendency to go back to the focus of self but, but sometimes the board meeting mm -hmm. you're giving the example of a board meeting i'm thinking of nursing stuff sure. so sure. once again i can I can see the examples that I've done this in my nursing practice, but to carry it over into regular, regular interaction, That's it's true. just, um, but, but sometimes in a board meeting, let's say Michael is trying to sell a product or, or, um, and he has passion and belief in that po and product and, and, and the value of it. Yeah. You you talked about this before. You have to have a practice in place where you have some space, because the space is where you do the push hands. It's you have to have that space, and you have to allow. <clears throat> within that space, you can allow the opportunity to allow for the situation to unfold, and for you to be able to express the reasons why you're passionate about your product will will eventually present itself. But but what unfortunately what sometimes happens to us is if our goal is um, to get our point across and we want techniques to get our point across and now there's no space to listen, to stick, to adhere, to join, you know, there's no questions. It's about, I wanna get you to believe this and, and this person is, um resisting convince me and and that setup doesn't work well mm -mm. because there's no there's no interplay going on there's no speaking and listening there's no push hands happening there's no you haven't really joined you haven't really stuck to you haven't really learned that's how interviews can be so you know i, I always encourage 
young people who ask me about, you know, their interview is to, you're both interviewing each other. You're interviewing the person to see if this job is a good fit for you. You know what your qualities are and what you bring to the situation. And they know what kind of qualities and what kind of person with certain skills come to the situation. So let's have this interaction so we can see if this fits instead of let me sell myself to you and convince you why I'm good for your company. It's the same with the boardroom. There has to be some space first, otherwise it's a um, oppositional approach. One person has one approach and the other person, uh, you're the person with the money and I'm the person that doesn't wanna let go of their money unless you can convince me why it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think a good example of that is um, we saw the movie Air and they talked about Martin Luther King's speech, how he saw that the crowd wasn't in it and he basically just freestyled the entire second half of the speech. So, you know, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King gave his speech to uh, one of the, I think he was a security guard at the time. And so he took Martin Luther King's speech and he starts looking at it and he's like, holy shit, this isn't what he said. Like this speech isn't what Martin Luther King delivered because now, again, in his own way, he wasn't doing this. This has been designed to help the modern mind authentically communicate with the moment themselves and others, which is why it should be practiced in that order. So he was present enough to identify that people weren't in it, probably could feel it. It was probably more of a feeling, a visual observation, and everything was probably uh, a part of it as well. And then he did the push hands. He started to freestyle because he knew that if he just continued to read the same boring speech, it wasn't, it wasn't gonna have the same effect. And so he adapted, he yielded, and uh, it was a very successful speech, as we all know, that I have a dream speech is quite popular. So Michael's in the boardroom or whoever's in the boardroom. I just use that as an example because it's a good one. You know, um, it is important. Folly doesn't imply not important. That's not how I'm using the word. That's not how the word is used. So uh, something that is folly can still be important. It's just not we're we're not going outside of our hydrostasy and using the words too serious too. It, when does something become too when it's out of balance? That's why we're using the word. If it's not enough, if we're not taking anything seriously, if nothing is important, now we're on an opposite side of that spectrum. And then before you know it, we're aloof and nobody wants to confide in us because we're not going to take it seriously. And most of the time, uh, these four things would not be occurring, this push hands. They wouldn't be asking follow-up questions because they don't really give a shit, <laughs> you know, because they're on the other side of, of importance. So things can be important, but when we start to overly attach and focus on ourselves or results or um, what we want or what we desire, we can start to gradually get out. And again, not everybody. Some people may naturally just have amazing communication skills. I haven't seen it. Even people who say they do are likely um, coasting, quite frankly. Okay, so we have arrived at the board meeting and Michael is giving his attention right? But he's not going to violate mindfulness because he's also joined them fully, which implies his own mind isn't spinning. You can't listen and think your own thoughts at the same time. Newsflash. You're, you're dividing your attention among your own words and you only have one voice. So you're barely taking in anything another person is saying when you're thinking your own shit while someone else is talking. And it's common. Oh God, just watch. Just pay attention to yourself. Just just give it a try. Just pay attention, see what's going on, and really just look at how interaction is occurring. So we have arrived in the board meeting, and I have given the members and the, uh, well, first of all, I've given the present moment attention. You know, I have attention in myself because I have the axis of hydrostasy for deliberate points, yada, yada. That's still there, by the way. So as Donna was pointing out, we still maintain our other points of attention. That's why this is a warrior training topic, because it's focusing on the unnecessary attachment to the to the self, which is strong and people can be quite blind to it. It's very it can get very subtle. It's not paranoia. It's subtlety. 
it's especially in men, the uh, tendency to manipulate and control in very subtle ways. We have words called gaslighting now for that type of, of thing. These words, you didn't hear the word gaslighting five years ago, but we're starting, you know, the world is starting to recognize that, wait a second, this is actually kind of shitty what you're doing to me right now. This is this is you trying to turn things around on, and it's been happening for hundreds and thousands of years. It was happening when my abusive dad was doing it to my mom. I did it to people when I was trying to turn the table and it's like, whoa, 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 no, you're the prop. And especially biologically, it's like uh, when men find someone attractive, almost everything they're doing, no matter what it is, is trying to woo them in. Even if it's like, even if it's trying to play cool, trying to play uninterested, they're trying to play. And again, not everybody. We're going to have a fraction of the population who isn't being as tightly manipulated by the biological destroyer. I can assure you it's rare. So we are in the boardroom. We have given our attention. And we have joined fully, which means that our mind isn't spinning. We're going to stay there, though. That's the trick, isn't it? It's staying there. That's the trick with our practice, isn't it? It's, it's actually quite easy to establish a point of attention. It's actually quite easy to give the point of attention the degree necessary for thoughts to relax a little bit. But the reason that we're always forgetting and remembering is because the sticking requires practice. And that's also another thing is that when people tell me that this is just natural, I'm like, well, maybe you've been practicing, but I need to really be a silent observer for a few months and really see what's going on. And then I'll let you know, because it will be indicative. Patterns will emerge. And that that's what traditional Chinese medicine is all about, observing the patterns that emerge in the person that day, et cetera. So we're in a board meeting. We have made a connection. We have fully joined, which means our thoughts aren't spinning. But we're there with them. Right? Maybe we're aware of our breath, but we're not thinking our own thoughts while we're interacting with the other person if it's not our turn to do that. How do we know if it's our turn to do that? Adhere. We're moving with the conversation rather than against it. And for most people that I have met in my entire life, this is a practice and a skill that needs to be developed. It's really hard to see when another person is thinking their own thoughts when you're talking. Watch the conversation and how it moves. How many questions are being asked? Where is the conversation going in generally? Is it just this ping pong where it's me, 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 back and forth, back and forth? And what are we even talking about? Like, why are we talking about people who aren't here? You know, why are we joking about what somebody did and they're not here to defend themselves? For example, I'm just saying, if that's occurring, there is an attachment to the construct of self and it's a pattern. It's likely a habit. And if it's a habit, that very likely means it doesn't have deliberate nature. If it doesn't have deliberate nature, it's very likely being led by the destroyers. It is being led by the destroyers. So this is a technique to help 99.999% of the potential population that wants to do the Egon practice to engage more authentically with the moment, engage more authentically with themselves. And what does authentically mean? Non-interference. What is interference? Your thought, your attempts to control, your attempts to manipulate. And then so we're in this board meeting and we're adapting and we're adhering. We notice that the room isn't really engaged. We notice that they're not paying attention. And all of a sudden, this creative idea comes to us and we share it with the group. It was an authentic interaction. Everybody leaves charged with, with energy. We feel good. We've had glimpses of that very likely. But to be able to create this type of thing consistently is a practice. And it requires practice to get better at because most people are not doing it. And just be just be real with yourself. Pay attention to yourself. How I've been talking here for a little while. How often have you gone to your own stream of thought while I'm talking here now? I'm not saying it's good or bad or but are it, it, are we doing it? Are we practicing the practice? Is it going with rather than against? And you'll see that all of these principles go back to non-interference, 
going with without trying to control and manipulate, not having the attachment to the sense of self, authentic interaction with the moment, with yourself, and then eventually, hopefully, with others. And that will inspire more authentic interaction. And that doesn't mean all the other interaction is is bad. Like it's that's a very, you know, rudimentary way of looking at things. But if you want to infuse it with personal power, with that creative essence, with intelligence and desire overlapping, this is an excellent technique to help have that happen. And like any technique, it will become so fluid, it looks like one thing. Just like Tai Chi, eventually it becomes so fluid, you would never have guessed it was broken down into 16 steps. You're like, no, like it's all just one flowy thing. So eventually the push hands, if you become so practiced at it, you're just there. The mind is clear. I'm with you. I'm ready to ask follow-up questions, adapt and move with the conversation. And quite frankly, the more familiar a person gets with another person, the more all of this is out the window. Because typically, the more familiar people get with one another, they get very habitual. You see this with couples. Is anybody a couple? How many times has, has this occurred where your significant other, they're not really there? They're not really listening. Maybe you're not really listening because your own thoughts are churning. Okay. That is deliberate folly. And folly does not imply unimportant because everything under the sun is folly. It's all folly. This is this aligns with the laughing Buddha. Why is the Buddha laughing at everything? Because it's we're, we don't need to take it all so it can be important. Folly is not synonymous with unimportant. So it, you can, importance is, is a, a factor that we designate. There's no ultimate importance it's just we designate what's important to us and with this practice we can designate that even more deliberately does that make sense ida how do you think that would relate this this idea of interaction you know using the push hands method how do you think that would fit into yang shen Isn't interacting with other people and healthy interactions important for the overall scope of wellness? I would I would think so, yeah. And there may be that one person who has just naturally put all of this together on their own. Cool. I have created this for the other vast majority who are not skilled at this at all. And even I practice it. I need to practice it. When my teacher's talking, when Shana's talking, when I'm looking at my dog and I'm petting him, I want to give him my undivided, authentic connection. Connection without judgment is love. L judgment is an opinionated thought that you're thinking. Interference. So you're literally interfering with the flow of love. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't speak because I have my phone in my, I don't know what you call it, a wee pack around your waist, which is in under my shirt, <laughs> and uh, I have headphones on, so. They call that a fanny pack here. Uh, I was about, I, well, I don't like saying that. I don't like saying that either because it doesn't usually go around the fanny, it goes around the front. Well, the fanny is a different thing in oh. the UK. <laughs> oh, okay, well. It's a different okay. body body part in the UK. Oh, yeah. oh shoot! Yeah. Well, we'll just use, we'll just call it the wee pack. Got it. Uh, okay, but yeah, yeah, everything you're saying. And while you were talking, I was thinking about who this relates to in my life. Instead of just what you were saying, you know, really listening to your conversation. Of course, I'm listening to it, but I was thinking about the people who. This relates to in my life, thinking about talking to my husband while he's watching the news, my brother-in-law, just things like that. So my thoughts were going off into a tangent even while you were speaking. Mm -hmm. So that happens. I'm I not would... perfect. Oh, no, no. It's like push, it's like push hands. Why do two yeah. people do push hands? 
they don't two people don't do physical tai chi push hands because they're both perfect they're doing it because they want to learn they want to grow they want to improve their interaction and sometimes when you're doing the when you're doing physical push hands there's a break in the flow that's attention attention has veered a little bit and then usually that's when they toss somebody is because oh look you lost your attention so it's not about you know being perfect i will say you know one thing that i personally do is the subtitles. I subtitle you when you talk. That really helps me stay with what you're talking about because the words that you're saying are going through my mind. I'm I'm subtitling it so I can stay with you. But even sometimes I'll have an idea. What do I do? I put it in chat. I'll write it down because there was a form of interference and that's okay to a certain extent, right? It hasn't taken us outside of our, we haven't we haven't lost our, our hydrostasy just because we're starting to think a little bit or I have an idea while you're talking, but I don't want to sit here and entertain that idea or otherwise I'll go way outside of my bubble. I'm going to have an idea. I'm going to write it down or I'm going to do something and then I'll come back to it later once I have given you the opportunity to deliver your thought fully. Does that make sense? And like anything, the more you practice the more it seems less like steps in just one thing. It will just start to seem like one fluid. Here I am fully connected, listening and hearing and joining. And this conversation is very adaptable. And we're going back and forth and we're giggling and having a good time, not taking things too seriously, fully in balance. And it was this, ah, what a refreshing conversation I just had with Ida. I didn't feel her trying to manipulate me once. It wasn't about my idea, or what I want you to do, or how I think you should think. None of that occurred. It was so refreshing. How refreshing are those conversations that are just so authentic? They're just so... Uh, sometimes when people have a breakdown, that's the best time to have a, an authentic uh, conversation with them. Of course, we don't need to break down to break through. If it happens, it happens. We don't need that. It's because in the place of breakdown, and that's why the connection was so strong, and I found in my nursing practice, because people were really at a vulnerable place when they were sick. Um, and when, when they're vulnerable, there's a, there's a, it's a new space. It's a new space without a lot of momentum going into it. And it's also a space where um, how it's going to unfold is unknown and that unknown is accepted. And there is a motivation towards the unfolding to be advantageous <laughs> to everyone involved. And, and people are more appreciative of your um, uh, efforts for that situation to unfold mm -hmm. um, in a way that serves everyone involved. Um, so sometimes the place of breakdown is where really deep connection occurs. Even um, in, um, in my end of life work, mm -hmm. um, the, some mm -hmm. of the greatest connections I've ever made have been then. Yeah, and we're just doing that before the end of life. That's all. My connections, my interactions, it's all still deliberate folly, but it's just so much more authentic. It's just so much more, I get so much more from the interaction and I'm practicing this. Because you're fully engaged in the present moment, really, without the rabbit hole thoughts. It's the same thing we're doing same thing. in the, it's, it's just an, it's just a different modality in which to have the same practice. The basics are all right there. They are. And um, it's organization to address specificity, right? So all I'm doing is reorganizing things to address specific things. Because if you really now just be honest and just really watch the interaction that people are having with one another. Look for the destroyers, look for patterns, especially if you know somebody really well, you'll be able to see their patterns because you're more familiar with them. You've been following them. Oh, around. I can see my own because I'm most familiar with me. Mm -hmm. So I can, you know, as you're speaking, I can see exactly. I can think of three conversations I had yesterday and the different degrees of quality mm -hmm. of those interactions. 
actions based on my own practice. Oh, you're done. Okay. I, I, the word degree really, really hit something for me because that's what we're talking about. So Donna, would you say that you can be self-aware of your body and still think thoughts while I'm talking? Yes, but much less so. It's everything is more balanced because I have other points of attention. When okay. I have one point of attention, the degree is way off balance. Okay. Let's say that you have self-awareness on your body, but you're also doing these four steps and you're focusing and making sure that you're doing these four steps. Are you going to be more or less likely to think your own thoughts? Far less likely. Far less likely. So it is self-awareness, but it's the degree. The more points of attention, the more the degree, I call this the mindfulness slider. It's in the Egong book. The mindfulness slider is to the degree that we are aware of the present. What are we aware of? To what degree are we rooted in the present or are we rooted at all? Do you see and what I mean? I found that the, I mean, the obvious is, it's stating the obvious, but the degree to which I am engaged in the present moment is directly proportional to the degree of space that I allow for something, for everything to be new, you know, for the newness, for the unfolding of the moment is directly proportional to the degree that I am maintaining my points of attention. Sorry, I was muted. I was just agreeing with you. Yes. So if I, so just to, as a, a heads up, so we have the first layer of Egong, very general. It's basically just mindfulness, um, presence, you know, techniques to become more familiar with this process of, oh, I can place my attention deliberately. Cool. Right. So that's kind of just what basic alignment is all about. Some people will just be like, duh. And like, they're really ready to move on. Some people will be like, why am I paying attention to my breath? What would that do? You know, uh, we saw that in the movie Air because the owner of Nike, the CEO of Nike was very Buddhist Zen, didn't know why he was doing it, but he was still doing it. And he's like, everybody just take a deep breath, relax. And then when he leaves the room, they're like, what did he just say? Like, why, what, why, what, what do we do? Eat our breath? They didn't know what he was talking about because I did this and so I did that in the beginning of this practice. Really? Why am I doing these techniques again? What is so important about the color blue? Like, well, how is that going to help me? And then that would actually get into the topic that you started with. The technique does not work by the technique alone, but the amount of momentum of practice skill behind it. So it's not the technique. You can go out and do any type of Qigong. You can go do karate. You can go do pole dancing. If you're doing the Qigong practice while doing that, you will benefit. I do, I do have a partiality to Tai Chi and things because of the circular movements, but I don't know, maybe to find a way to do spheres around your pole as you do pole dancing. So uh, it's not the technique necessarily, but the, the amount of uh, momentum of skill behind the technique. So yeah, that makes sense, right? Uh, I was going to, I had a comment to make about that. I, I think I got off onto a little tangent and lost it. Yeah. But, oh yeah, I was saying, okay, so basic alignment, very general, which this, this one's going to be done within a week or two, and I'll share it with you guys on PDF. And then you can tell me like, you know, uh, spelling errors and underlying versus underlining. That's very helpful. Um, and I'll make those corrections. But book two is called the Tai Chi Mind, because I'm framing the entire practice in alignment with Tai Chi. Warrior training will be in alignment with Don Juan. And then hydrostasy will be authentically my voice. It's going to be pretty much all me. Does that make sense? And then we'll have the secret fifth that I, I haven't talked about, which is a, a direct part of hydrostasy, but it's interacting with the energy body directly. Okay. So what we've talked about today in terms of deliberate folly is a warrior training topic. Guess where I got the phrase, Don Juan? 
guess how he described the phrase? Just like Buddha. We're not taking things too seriously. And of course, Carlos is like, oh, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to say that nothing is important. And Don Juan cuts him off. He said, no, those are two different words. Something can be important and still be folly. You're just not making it too. You're not taking it too. And of course, what he was teaching Carlos at the time was dissolving self-importance. The human being's tendency to be self-infatuated. Of course, with the capstone, you see the self in addition to every other aspect of the totality of who you are, which includes the moment, which includes underlying intelligence, the fabric of the cosmos, the Tao itself, and you. When you hurt, I hurt. We all hurt. It's all interconnected. This is called compassion. Compassion is understanding, recognizing the interconnectedness of all things and caring about that connection to all things. That was Thich Nhat Hanh's definition that I really like. All right, so any questions about that? I think that is a fair summary of the topic, and it will show up in warrior training. Warrior training gets intense because most a lot of people I, I have encountered who have claimed to have dissolved their attachment to self. Mm. Not so sure. Uh, why? Because of indications and patterns. That's why Chinese medicine doesn't use the term diagnosis. I'm not diagnosing you and putting you in a still frame. I will, however, learn from the indications that you're presenting currently and the patterns. Uh, of course, for patterns, I need you to come in and see me multiple times. So if Donna comes in the first time, I don't know her patterns. I haven't established. Uh, that's why we typically say we need to see you at least for a month so that I can look at your indications every day that you come in and correlate that with patterns and potentially patterns of the seasons, patterns based on things that you're telling me, you know. So that's all we're doing here is we're observing the patterns and the indications. Sure. You don't know if something that I'm seeing is um, an indication of evolution <laughs> of my thought or something that I've said for the last you know, whatever, because it makes me sound smart mm. because I, I picked some, some clever words or whatever, whatever the example is, it's hard to sum up in a, in a, yeah, you know, even the example that you gave of Martin Luther King and his speech, you know, with, with practice, you probably, if you were in the audience can or even if you watch it now and playback, you can see when someone is speaking with um, maybe a plan of what to speak about and some topics to speak about, but they are um, improv, improving or speaking extemporaneously um, as they feel it because it's a communication with the audience and the crowd and who attended and the responses that they're feeling and the energy that they're feeling, as opposed to reciting well, even a memorized speech or reading it off of a teleprompter. You can see the difference in the moment, but other than that, it's hard to tell um, unless you've seen patterns in, in people before, because some people can be, passionate or even um i don't know i'm trying to think of like politicians now they might seem to be eloquent and then when you watch them speak on several occasions their eloquence becomes more hollow because it's just words and it there doesn't seem to be it, they're not really answering questions it's a pre-prepared soundbite that they've established right yeah and that's inauthentic and so that will lead to hydrostasy. In hydrostasy, this isn't as broken up. Like we're not looking at it necessarily into these individual parts. This is the later stages of hydrostasy, of course, but you will be able to interact with the energy directly, your own energy and how it's interacting with the other human being. And you'll be able to instantly know whether the interaction is authentic. That's not a judgment. Judgment is an opinion. An opinion exists in a thought. I can discern, deduce, evaluate without thought. That's not judgment. 
discernment and judgment, two different words, two different reasons, two different things. The discernment sense? can be based on energy alone. Energy alone. You know, Absolutely. I think I gave the example in class of the man that I came upon that was sitting and, and there was a bird that landed that was squawking. And I said, I think he's talking to you. And he looked at me and said, I, I think he's talking to you. And it felt energetically like a very pure moment. He was very engaged in his present moment and noticed the bird. And so was I. And then we shared that moment. I have since seen that man. Um, it took me a while to realize it was the same man, but it was the energy and the feeling that I had every time I see him now, any interaction that we have, even if it's silent, just seems so present and authentic in the moment that um, it is an energy that he has and carries that can be felt. And I can discern that. And it's not a judgment about you know, I don't know what he does in his life or who he is. So I, I don't really have a lot of judgment about it, but I can feel the difference in that when I pass him and there is some form of energy exchange as opposed to with other people who are minds are occupied or when mine is occupied, I can feel the difference. Yeah. And so that's the thing about the fifth layer of the practice and interacting with energy directly is that there's really not a lot of words for it. There's not a lot, there's only principles. So that's why I call it the abstract principles. So I'm just taking the principles of interacting with energy directly. And at that point, a person should be able to really understand those principles, maintain those principles and everything will flow naturally. There's no reason to judge it or dissect it or anything like that. Your organization of, of the, uh, relationship technique the push hands analogy with joint uh connect join stick it here is really helpful to me for that for what you just explained mm -hmm. and i encourage folks to practice try it i know you see it you see it on the whiteboard it makes sense maybe in your mind or maybe you think it's the most stupid thing ever try it really try it in your interactions with other human beings to see if these things are occurring and if they're not good meaning that there's no you know violation of, of principle in the interaction and one of the biggest violations is typically because we get comfortable with people we get back into patterns we start to coast our practice we maybe still have a little degree of attention but this is a directional thing so we're starting to go away the more that we get involved into the social interaction and then before you know it we're talking shit we're coasting we're right back and maybe it's funny and we're having fun <laughs> it's all chocolate okay it hasn't gotten to suffering yet but you are outside of your hydrostasy circle and the longer you exist there the more that you invite the potentiality for suffering remember when we get outside of the circle it's not instant suffering right a sexual encounter can be an extreme you winning the lottery can be an extreme that's fine it's existing in an extreme that will eventually cause suffering, but I'm not a fortune teller. So I can't tell you exactly what that suffering is going to be. Well, you can tell what it's going to be in general terms. It's going to be a place where there's no space sure. for evolution or adapt adaptation or evolution. So what form it takes doesn't really matter. That space mm -hmm. gets closed when you exist in an extreme there. That's, the space, when you say engage the space, that space closes down. Oh, God, yes. Oh, no, that space is long gone. Uh, how is everybody doing with engage the space? That's the, uh, that's the most potent technique I can offer in hydrostasy. Of course, it's hydrostasy, so you had to create the space in the first place. That space has a feeling. There's something there. Like, I'm, I can, I can only uh, illustrate the path, but, I mean, you got to walk it to feel it and know it. But has anybody tried? Have you tried to engage the space that you've created in the overall amount of thought to watch that space grow and see what comes through? Not only what comes out, but what is now allowed to come in. All of a sudden, the exchange is not being interfered with. Engage the space is essential to my hydrostasy practice. Of course, but space You has can to use that in terms of your Michael boardroom example. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even if Michael has a prepared 
mm, a desire. This is my product. This is what I want to communicate. This is what I want these people to know so that I'm, I'm going to give them the opportunity to invest or to buy this because it it's a win-win for everybody. I'm going to benefit from it from a financial standpoint, but I'm also sharing a product that I feel is um, contributes to the well-being of their business or their personal life or whatever. And um, but if you're if you're not engaging the space, it it becomes a force. <laughs> you're trying to convince somebody. You're trying. There's a lot of judgment, and um, there's not a lot of listening going on. But if you're engaging the space, then there's that space for push hands where the opportunity for that to arise and be delivered in an authentic way, just like the speech we talked about. Um, there's there's that wiggle room in there for the authentic communication to exist because you're practicing those four aspects of relationship. Mm -hmm. And then the place where that, it might not even be in the words that he practiced in the car or on the way or that he wrote down. Um, they might come out exactly that way or not, but if you're not engaging the space, then the opportunity for it to be communicated um, is, is, we're blind to it because our, we're busy trying to do our own thing. That does sound familiar. Yeah. Everything you just said at some point, I think I have done that. <laughs> Maybe even recently to some extent, because I'm still practicing. There's no perfection. There's no leveling up. It depends sometimes on how much it brushes up against habit as well. So not every situation and every interaction is going to be equal measure. Yeah, I can feel the, the space grow and constrict to direct proportion to uh, my self-importance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's fair, you know, I mean, I get why it happens. I'm not, you're not bad or evil because, but it is it is one of the destroyers and it will cause it will lead to the fifth the accumulation of that fifth destroyer and, and then now i'll just frame it this way real quick and then i can just take questions until we go my thesis is that because human beings are so lost in thought that interference in the natural flow of everything else is cutting off our connection to other aspects of the human experience and our own cognition because we're just thinking all the time. So look at this. If you were to come to Chicago and spend, maybe get on the train during rush hour, how many people do you think are looking at their cell phones? I'm not judging. I'm not labeling. I'm, I'm, making, an, I'm making a point. This is a, to illustrate what's occurring most likely in the vast majority of the human experience. What are, we, what are they doing? Okay, when they're not looking at their cell, almost all, you're right. Uh, and let's say they're not looking at their cell phone. How many do you think are thinking about something? All. Almost all of them are either thinking or they're looking at their cell phone or they're in some way distracting themselves. Every now and then, though, you'll get that kid. And they're on the train and they love trains and they're looking out that front car because they can see now they're connected. They're having a good time. The energy's flowing. You know, that's the child's mind. They can access that easier. Not in principle easier, but just because they have had less accumulation of shit. So the thesis is that all those people on the train who are doing that are not able to access the other aspects of human cognition because it's being interfered with with thought. For example, if you want to take a pulse, Donna, have you ever heard that it's best for both the patient and the practitioner to look away? I don't remember being instructed to do that, but oh, I do it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Well, we're we're instructed to do that. Why do you think that is? Because you want to focus on feeling ah. and not what you're seeing. Okay. Do you also have to kind of clear your mind while you're really sensing in and trying to read the, the, especially in Chinese medicine, because we're not just getting rate, 
We're looking at depth. We're looking at quality. We're looking at all kinds of aspects of the pulse. Western medicine just looks at the rate and then they're on. But um, if I really wanted to sense into something. Sure, you have to feel that if it's thready or if it's bounding or if it's, oh, nice. yes, so all of those fiery things. Fiery and yeah, all of those different Yes, and so you you want to focus on feeling. So you want to, mm. of course, you're, you're, you you want to eliminate other distractions, mm -hmm. which is mostly thought. You mostly want to focus thought. on feel and not, and not, yeah. Perfect example, isn't it? If you really want to sense into the person's pulse and get the different, how the hell are you going to tell what wiry is if you're just sitting there thinking dumb shit in your mind while trying to do it? Or your mind isn't even on the activity that you're doing because you're just so distracted with your cell phone. Imagine me trying to take your pulse while looking at my cell phone. I'm not going to get an accurate pulse because my attention is too divided. It's too focused on its habits. The security guard at Mariano is looking at his cell phone. Do you feel safe? Is he going to be ready to spring into action? Probably not. He's going to be delayed because he's too busy texting or posting on Facebook about how he hates his job. I just made that up. I don't know. He probably loves it. So if I want to really sense into my pulse, if I want to sense energy directly, I cannot do it while I'm thoroughly distracted. And that's the first enemy of knowledge, distraction. Oh, this all just coincides so well, doesn't it? Like the whole system is just so elegant. So the idea, this is my fundamental thesis, is that in life, when we get out of our own way, all of a sudden we can sense the pulse of the universe. Oh, that's nice. I just made that up just now. We, we can sense more. We can feel more. That is impossible when we're being led by the destroyers and we're distracted from knowledge, it's impossible. You can't do both. So we have to create the space necessary for us to engage and for things to flow. And then there's non-interference. And before you know it, we are sensing energy directly. And we're able to even establish the difference between emotion and energy vibration. They're not the same. But if, if you're not sensitive enough, you'll easily confuse the two. Oh, I felt this. I actually could probably take your blood and show you where that feeling is occurring in your blood draw, you know, in your in your blood work. That's why you're feeling that, you know, it's a it's an andamide. It's it's serotonin. It's like it's great. Don't get me wrong. Our emotions are lovely, but there is a difference between sensing energy directly and you just observing your own emotions. I'm not vilifying emotion. I'm just saying there's a difference between intelligence and the desires that lack intelligence. Intelligence will be good for everything and everybody because it will understand and, and coincide with the interconnectedness of all things. So it's not intelligent if, if somebody else is going to suffer from it or anything else in the universe could potentially knowingly suffer from it. It's not intelligent. Okay, questions, comments, concerns, that's it. I think that wraps up deliberate folly. And um, if it's a technique you want to use, it's warrior training technique, use it. Uh, if you don't find it valuable, don't. Fine. But even just do energy works that way. It can, yeah. Because if I've got... I mean, I feel the difference between being overwhelmed by the tasks that I perceive are before me or just do energy. Because in the just do energy, maybe it all gets done, maybe it doesn't all get done. And how I chew, it, it's like almost a push hands with my um, environment, <laughs> you know, with in, in yep. adding it with organization is a, is a push hands thing. Bingo. <laughs> Yeah, and it's that's why all, I, it's all folly. It's all folly, and that's why I said we start it with the present moment. Then we do the the technique with ourselves, and now we're going to be even more prepared to do the technique with another person. So the folly, the word folly, is 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 not um, in insignificant or inconsequential. It's folly in terms of lightening the degree of importance. Yes. Yes, and and if if you don't have the lightness, 
there is an attachment to the construct of self very likely because why right. are you taking this so seriously? Why have you allowed yourself to go out of balance because you just have to, do, you know? Right, wait. for the boardroom technique. So if there's some degree of folly, which means um, a lighter sense of importance, then the opportunity for that interaction to go phenomenally always exists. So, but it's the definition of what phenomenally means. Maybe you sold your product. Maybe everybody in the boardroom bought your product. Um, maybe nobody did. And because nobody did, you went to a different meeting that it happened in. Like the opportunities become clearer because none of it is weighted with a degree of importance that causes an imbalance. Mm. and makes pulls you away from engaging your the space right and that's why the result of that if you maintain it or to it to a large degree maintain it to you to the capacity which you can in the moment you've come to look back and say i can't help but notice that every everything is where i put it because you you didn't um you didn't compress and compartmentalize and 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 place so much importance on it that you narrowed the space you want to engage. Yeah, I would say when you use the word lightness, that feels like balance. So it's importance within balance rather than when we get out of balance and all this. Hey, Michael, uh, you don't have to answer because I don't know where you are in the world right now, you know transit or whatever but how often have you in the business world met people who are attached to their own ideas does that happen often where people are like i'm right we should do it my way i'm willing to bet that in the business world that is occurring well i've seen it <laughs> i've seen it in the corporate world where everybody thinks they're right barbecue and religion nobody can agree and everybody thinks they're right that's the opposite of deliberate folly. They're taking it too seriously. And what happens? The flashlight of attention is focused on their conceptual assemblage of self. So we see all of these examples occurring in the world, which gives this practice validity. It's like, oh, this practice can help me interact with these dynamics that we're seeing all around us. Michael, maybe you've even seen that in yourself, where you're like, I have this good idea. Why don't, why don't they just fucking listen to me? Well, you don't know why they're not listening to you, maybe because we're not doing our practice. We haven't created the space necessary, and maybe your idea isn't the most elegant. Maybe, I don't know, you know, who knows if we're not really paying attention and we're not really connected. Um, but Donna, when you mentioned Just Do Energy, remind me later that this will be a part of counterbalance, Hong Lu Ji An. Pong, expanding your senses of perception, expanding your bubble using proprioception, which is considered the sixth sense. So we have Pong, and if we have G, that's the type of energy that's coming from the center. And what is required for just do energy? A mind that is not fighting the moment or itself. You have to you have to be clear to have just do energy, otherwise interference. So do you really need to do the dishes? Why are you doing the dishes? Wouldn't you rather just have your tennis out on the beach? Sorry for that example. It was on Facebook the other day. So the idea, uh, so we have Pung, which is the expanding energy. We have G, which is just do energy. We have An, which I associate to a type of presence and rooting so that we can adapt. And they don't have to be in any particular order. They can exist independently. Or when you get really practiced, it starts to become one fluid thing. You can break it down into Pung Lu Ji An until you get really good at it, and then it just looks like one fluid motion. And of course, the redirection technique is the loop, the redirection. And those are techniques, just like deliberate folly is full of these techniques. You have to try it. If you we get... talk about that more next time? We can talk about that if you remind me, yep. And that will be in Igong, uh, I'm calling it the Tai Chi Mind. Egong book two, and it's almost done. And that, what I'm talking to you about, that section has already been written. So Pong, Lu, Ji, An, all of that uh, push hand stuff. But I will also get into Ting. We were talking about sensing into the pulse. 
That's ting. That's listening energy, sensing energy. That is impossible with interference because all you're sensing is the interference. That's what has the screen time. It's the difference between what makes a good medical practitioner a good medical practitioner. So there's so much to learn and you can learn every bit of information and data, but if you don't incorporate Ting, mm. diagnosis is, is um, far less elegant. Mm. Some great doctors that I've worked with um, intuit so much because they listen, because they do the push hands with the patient when they're speaking to them and interacting with them. A lot of nurses do. Mm -hmm. A lot of nurses do and, and kind of have to force it on the doctor because they're just coming in. The nurses are spending more time with the patient. Just like you said, I need to follow them around a little bit to see how things have changed. So the you can't just read it out of the notes when the doctor comes in and reads the nurse's notes. Like you, you know, you have to interact and uh, you know, I noticed a change in this person. I don't care that they're 88. I noticed the change in their cognition. Something's going on right now that needs attention. So it's, sometimes it is an energy thing. You can feel the difference. You can feel it when you walk in the room. Um, so, yeah, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And when there's less interference, Donna, when you feel it, when you walk in the room, the feeling is going through a clean lens. Oftentimes people do get an intuitive feeling or they do get a feeling, but it's going through a lens that isn't clean. And then it just becomes a reflection of self. Well, the reason I can understand it isn't from it, it, it's less so from my practice now, which is just evolving to that place, my practice in my life. But my practice in nursing has a lot of momentum and years behind it. And as soon as I walk in the door at work and get on the floor of wherever I'm working, I, I have to clear my mind of a bunch of things because I have a I have an organizational, I have a just do focus I have to do, and I have a patient focus, which is different with every individual when I when I walk in their room for those eight hours. So I had a practice already in place for that that I could see over the years got better and better because of practicing it. Um and and the three parts of knowledge you know, and, and, and how that gained momentum as well. So it's funny now when you bring up this stuff, how I can incorporate it into my daily life practice because the principles apply. And then that's where Yang Sheng comes in because now that we have all of our ability with our Yigong practice, Yang Sheng becomes easy. And this will cover every single aspect of mental, physical, emotional, well-being, and health. Because you've created some space. So that's why you can exactly. see it from an from that organizational and from experience yes. perspective. Well, other people would pick up the Yang Sheng book and be like, wait, what? It wants me to get up early? I have to stop eating so many sweets? Like, this just sounds like a bunch of judgment and control. But with Igong, it's like, oh, this is actually all pretty easy, you know, because I have the mental focus and clarity to identify that these things actually help me maintain balance. They help me feel better. They help me feel stronger. That Some people, I'm just being honest, have never felt the degree of clarity that can come from embodying Yang Shen. The mind becomes so clear. The body becomes so invigorated. A lot of people just are not feeling this. And how do I know? It's indicated in the patterns of the world. Not a judgment. We see it indicated in the behavior and the patterns and the actions of the world itself. We can see that we're not really accessing this divinity within our Divinity, I use that very loosely. Uh, this power within ourselves. Because we're too distracted. And we're wasting the opportunity for the human species to evolve beyond just thinking about shit all the time. Does that make sense? So Yeah, well, there's nothing in the young in that Yangshan book that makes me feel like this is an aberration to the principles. <laughs> you know, there's nothing that strikes me as ah, skip that. Mm -mm. You know, uh, maybe I will skip it and try something else, but that sure, it doesn't sure. come from a place of it violating anything. Because it's all based on principle. Yeah. 
Yang Cheng is based on principle. And there can be other ways to do things. You don't necessarily have to finish your shower with cold water, but what are they implying? They're implying balance. When you take a hot, a hot shower, you open up all your pores. If you don't close those pores, you're going to go out and things can actually invade the dermal barrier because the pores are open. Wind and everything else can start. Somebody sneezes on the back of your neck. Believe it or not, it's not all just going in through your mouth and nose. If your pores are open, you can take in virus. You can take in bacteria through the pores in your skin. Most people don't know that. Medication know. medication yeah. is delivered dermally. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. It's like, duh. But there is a myth out there that everything that touches your skin gets into your bloodstream false. I know. I yeah. had to say that that's during awesome. oil classes. Yeah, that's you absolutely know, it, The oils, the way that you can use them, depending on how the application, mm. is um, internally, if they're designed to be taken internally, because they're just plants, yeah. oil yeah. from plants. Um, topically, you know, you rub it on your feet or you rub it on an area because it absorbs into your skin, anything you put on your skin. So all those chemicals in your makeup and your soap and your shampoo, it gets in you. Mm -hmm. or, if, or to inhale it, diffuse it, cold diffusion. If you smell something, you have taken it into your body. So when you're smelling the exhaust of a car or secondhand smoke or anything, you've taken it in internally. Yes. And then, of course, and uh, we don't have to get into that because you guys didn't sign up for that necessarily. But we, I can actually frame that now in terms of traditional Chinese medicine and why that's important and how that transforms into the rest of the body, bloods, fluids, lymph, everything, the cell. So here's here's the last thing I'll say. And then any other questions or whatever, and then we'll go. The last thing I'll say is that when I look at Yang Sheng, when I look at these practices, I'm not looking at longevity. That's that's kind of the Taoist fo folly or the excuse me, the Taoist contradiction is that a lot originally the Taoists called themselves immortals because they were all looking for longevity. I'm looking for quality because death is my advisor. Space junk could fall from the sky tomorrow and maybe I don't duck, <laughs> bob or weave and it hits me and I'm done. So I'm not necessarily seeking longevity balance and quality is super important. Not waking up with aches, not waking up with pains, not just throwing caution to the wind, eating whatever the hell we want to, and then it catches up with us and we don't feel good. You still might make it to 110, but the quality may not have been there. Do you see what I mean? This is all about quality of life for me. And that's how I present it. I think about it less with what not to do. Like, yes, if I wake up with aches and pains, then I've probably done something. But if I if my focus is on quality and balance, then um, then I arrive at the moment of stiffness or pain with with some immediate awareness and adaptation. But if I keep my space engaged <laughs> and open then there will always be the i can't help but notice i slept this way therefore i have this ache and pain or i put i walked an extra mile and so i have this pain and so now i can even interpret my pain or stiffness as growth bodybuilding side effect or overdoing side effect or however it fits into my balance i don't even want to break it down but if i'm maintaining that uh, engagement with the present moment then all of that will become apparent and so i will become more fine-tuned in what serves my balance or what pulls me away from my balance i don't like to focus on what not to do yeah, no. And then, I mean, that's exactly the same direction that Yang Sheng takes. And that's what I recommend. We don't focus on what not to do. Let's focus on what we can do. Let's focus on these little things such as, you know, adding the cold water. That's not what not to do. It's not saying don't take a hot shower. Although if the world stopped taking hot showers, we could save so much energy and electricity. Or if we limited our showers to just five, to actually just cleaning our bodies rather than self-indulging in the hot water all the time, 
then we could actually, uh, it's those small changes that could add up to absolutely phenomenally large changes on the fifth destroyer level or the, you know, that fifth element destroyer. I think we just lost power for a second. Um, but yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. And so Yang Sheng and the way that I present things aren't, this isn't what you shouldn't do. Like Donna, don't drink that juice. I would just say, make sure that we drink water and let's make, I know, I don't know what it is, but let's make sure that, water. Uh, yeah, don't drink that alcohol. It's like, no, let's just make sure that what we're doing is within balance and that it, alcohol doesn't feel in balance for me anymore, ever. <laughs> it just doesn't. And I will say that when you reduce sugars, when you reduce salts, when you reduce those things, there's a film that comes off of your brain and you either experience it or you don't. I'm not making it up though. We, Shana and I have vastly reduced our overall sugar intake, our sodium intake, our carbohydrate intake, intermittent fasting, carb cycling. Holy shit. Like, I just didn't even know that we could feel this way. Nobody told me. And if they did, I wasn't listening because I was too busy trying to say that now I feel fine. Like, try to, that pain I get in my chest every every other day, that's natural. That's normal. We're human. Ugh. We're human. Ugh. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns before we head to next week? Book two will be done soon. Website will be done soon. I will have a doctorate soon. I will be presenting this in clinic in addition to Yang Sheng and other aspects of traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, maybe someday Gong will be a more focused on aspect of Chinese medicine or traditional East Asian medicine or non-reductionalist uh, holistic medicine. Any questions? Okay. If you have questions, comments that you want to send me privately, just send it and we can talk about it next week. Uh, next week, we can talk about those uh, warrior train. Oh, no. These techniques are presented, I'm sorry, in uh, the Tai Chi mind. Pang, Lu, Ji, An, Ting, uh, Dong, uh, Dong Ji, with, uh, Feng Song, all of these things, I have related them to the Igong practice. You just made that up. Uh, no, don't I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, don't just understanding energy. Uh, I wrote it down, so I'll remember next time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Feng Song is uh, relaxation or least amount of muscular tension to perform uprightness with the body, mm -hmm. or in movement. The least amount of muscular tension to perform the movement is Zong, uh, Feng Song. And I'll relate all of these Tai Chi terms to the Igong terms. And then, of course, you'll probably see later why I'm coinciding this is so that the, in warrior training, I will offer more Tai Chi, more Qigong, and it will already align with Igong, put it together, add it to Yang Shen, you have a complete wellness system, a self-care system that I think in, from what I see around me is unparalleled. Not that that's important. Hopefully it is paralleled. Hopefully we get lots of parallels because then the world will be a much better place. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll see you next week. Uh, thanks for hanging out. And if you have questions, comments, or concerns, just let me know. Feel free to invite your friends to group study, but the group study will start to rise once I start to present this in practice and I start to present it in schools. Eventually I plan to teach it in, I will add Igong in somehow I'm going to interject that when I teach university because I do want to teach TCM, at least foundations and things like that. Okay. Thanks, Ernest. You're welcome. Have a good rest of your day. And, uh, you know, as I start to get into this, if anybody is is interested in physical, um, I am actually getting more and more qualified every day to help evaluate physical ailments, uh, physical indications and patterns in relation to traditional Chinese medicine. I don't know how looking at your tongue will look on a computer, and I don't think I can take your pulse, um, but we could probably talk about, you know, some of these aspects and see if we can find an underlining thing. So. Okay, well, thanks for hanging out, everyone, and I'll see you again soon. And I will post this recording because uh, it was recorded. All right, see you guys.